This is a CC Radio podcast. Welcome to episode 215 of the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews podcast. Today we're going to talk about some Aussie stuff with you. My name's Wayne Kant. How the fuck are you? <laughs> exactly how we talk. My name is Paul. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. We count down movies and sometimes television in order of awesomeness. And today, as Wayne has said, top 10 Aussie films. Aussie films, mate. That is it. Uh, now, if you're a long term listener to the show, and I mean very long, yeah. I went back and had a look. It was episode eight that we originally did this topic. Oh, we did this before? 200. You said this last week as well. Do you? I don't remember the shit I just is did. Us. <laughs> it's us. It's flaps and us. <laughs> Welcome to the soundboard. Wow. Oh, yeah, I did say we it last week. Exactly the same way we ended last week. week. <laughs> so, if you are one of those people who's like, oh, I'll just listen through to a bunch of episodes, listen to the end of 214, then the start of 215, that would have been a very surreal moment for you. Well, that's good because at least you know I didn't recycle any material because <laughs> I don't fucking remember doing it. <laughs> I went back. Found episode eight, made my list, Did you? and then pr- pulled up my list from then to see how similar it was. Some similarities, some real differences. Ah, so interesting. Almost four, in fact, it is four years, almost to the week since we did this particular countdown. It's a little spooky. It is a little bit at all, indeed. So that's what we got lined up for you. It's going to be a big show, obviously celebrating cinema in our part of the world. And if you go back to, if you could listen to that episode, only patrons can, because otherwise it's disappeared off our service. Oh, I see. You will remember that we were, you in particular, were dark on Australian cinema. I was like, yeah, it's not as good, <laughs> but I found enough to mind. But you were very, very anti. I don't know if I can make 10 for this list. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Look, I'm not Has your s- attitude changed? It's changed a little. I'm a more mellow man in my old age. <laughs> I'm looking for more nuance within the cinema because I'm, you know, before it was all spectacle. Yep. And so, yes, I'm not saying it was easy to put together. I'm not saying all that. Right. So, in other words, you are... I stand resolute, motherfucker! Somewhat resolute. Okay, somewhat resolute. Is that the same ring? <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to the countdown, though, I just want to share a couple of our long-term and very best listeners. Uh, Tara Maholik. She gave Tara. a list for... She was the first person who got on board for the top 10 heroic moments from a few ah. weeks back. If you haven't heard that episode, go back and check it out. Here are the two films she nominated. No Man's Land and Wonder Woman, which a lot of people said, including my good self. Boom. And Ophelia's Last Stand in Pan's Labyrinth. No, have you seen Pan's Labyrinth? I have indeed. That's a pretty good heroic moment for a little girl. It is, it is, it is because, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm still struggling with the movie, but yeah. Yes, so I thought that was worth mentioning. Not bad, good one. And also from the same episode from Jordy Davidson, who gave pretty standard list in one sense, Star Trek to Wrath of Khan, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring moment with Boromir. And then he said something about Avengers Endgame, which is why I didn't read it out. And I still yeah, won't, yeah, yeah. still too new. But he had a couple of honorable mentions I thought were, were really worth mentioning. So thank you, Geordie. Leon pulling the pin on his grenades in The Professional. Very heroic. Yeah. Killing I himself and killing Stansfield. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. And Data sacrificing himself for Picard in Star Trek Nemesis. Oh, I remember that. That was actually quite good too. Not yeah. bad. So there we go. So I just want to give those uh, I didn't mind that movie. a little bit of love. Nice one, son. One more thing before we get rolling. Yeah. Last week, I appeared on Pat and Jason Binge Movies podcast. I see. So Jason and I, Pat was away on assignment learning about the next movies he has to binge. We talked about early John Carpenter. So, early 80s John Carpenter. We reviewed in detail Big Trouble in Little China. Okay. And then did a whole bunch of other films around that point in time and kind of ranked them from five to one from the big JC. Always a classic. Although, I don't really care for John Carpenter, but I know you do. (laughs) We certainly do. Had a great time with Jason. We really do get into some detail about Big Trouble and and he's a great great host to have on. In fact, we have those boys on the show in the not too soon future. It's a bit of reciprocation. Nice. So, check that out if you can. Pat and Jason binge movies. Plug time. Plug time. Oh yeah, like for the, the Podcast Republic app, a robust and good ass app for your Android device. Go ahead and download that shit, then go listen to some podcasts on it. Know what I'm saying? All of them, including, but after us. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much to Podcast Republic. All right then. Result of last week's episode, our poll for the episode two fourteen top ten gross out films. Yes. Some varied lists, but basically boiled down to this: it's a draw. I, you know what, I, I was uh, taking a dump recently and, and, and read the, that result, and I was like, oh damn, it's a draw. <laughs> How appropriate that you read that on the daily. Yeah, 26 votes a piece. Now, what some of the listeners had to say, Brianna uh, Petty said, I'm still voting for Wayne, even though he didn't do his research about Austin Powers. I'm so sorry, I, knew, I, I listened back to that, and I'm so wrong, it's number two, sorry. sorry. Uh, Adam Millier said, voting for Paul because Wayne hates Freddie got fingered. What is more gross than licking a compound fracture? Lol. 
Yes, but what's got to be funny too? What? Got to be good. Uh, Bob Alice said, I voted for pork, said the better list. Thank you, Bob. Fair enough, Bob. <laughs> this call. is the one that made me laugh the most from Scott Thornton. Voting for Paul because I feel sorry for him for his recent losing streak. <laughs> but he won last week! I think before that, lost like three or four in a row. Uh, Glenn Sullivan, Paul gets my vote as he knows which number movie in a franchise he's talking fair about. Enough, fair and enough. Sam Hurley, now this is who I drew. Okay. Oh, okay. Earlier this morning on Twitter, I, he responded to this week's topic, Australian films. And I said, Sam, you and I are always in sync. Therefore, it always amazes me when you vote for Wayne every week. <laughs> And he went, I voted for Wayne. He had a European chick. Like, that's bullshit. He went back and changed the vote because he accidentally hit on you. Fuck and he meant you. to hit me. <laughs> I would have won if it weren't for your tweetings. Well, because of your fat fingers, or Sam's fat fingers, <laughs> you would have won. So there's nothing between who wins it. Yeah, well, whatever, whatever. Sam, of course, the movie views and 20Q's podcast. So uh, get into them if you haven't checked them out. Also, European Jiggle rocks. <laughs> <laughs> really doesn't. Fucking great show. Great show. <laughs> That's all the preamble for today's episode, except this is the last week before Livestream for a Cure, run by the Epic Film Guys, kicks off, which is a effort to raise $7,500 for the fight against cancer, Boom. which the Cancer Research Institute, I think it is, in the States have yeah. pledged to double. So they will be raising fifteen grand if Let's they hit fly. their target. So here's an ad for that. If you have a chance, please give generously and tune in to the Epic Film Guys for 40 hours of podcasting entertainment next weekend. I'm Nick. And I'm Justin, and we can't believe it's already time for the 2019 live stream for The Cure. Thanks to our amazing peers, listeners, and supporters, last year we crushed our goal of $5,000 for the Cancer Research Institute. The Cancer Research Institute is funding research into immunotherapy to create a future immune to all forms of cancer. Every single cent we raise goes to them. This year, we're aiming our sights even higher with our most ambitious event to date. Join us May 17th through the 19th on twitch.tv slash epicfilmguys for 40 hours of live content from us and other amazing shows who will join us to try to reach $7,500. Please visit www.livestreamforthecure for more information or to find out how you can be a part of the event. Together, we can make a difference. The top 10 Australian films. Aussie films. Of all time. Nice. Now, Wayne's already said he had a few problems. I had no such. I've got a lot of honorable mentions. Yeah, but you watch everything. And my list has changed (laughs) markedly, particularly the bottom half of the list. Everything else has sort of shuffled around. I have, as as mentioned, I have zero idea what I thought. This is just your legitimate. Here's my best 10. I'm really scared that I'm picked a movie that I panned in the first one <laughs> and now like I don't even know what's gonna happen. So let's go. Whatever. Well we, given we you change. couldn't remember having a conversation last week, how the That's fuck right. are you gonna get by <laughs> That's what four I'm saying. weeks? Who knows, four years man. ago? You wanna compare, compare, I don't care. I think you should lead away then. All right then. With your number ten. All right. My number ten is a movie called The Bank. Okay. Now yeah, it I'm is not a surprise this is on your list. It's a little well, here's the thing. Two thousand, right? Near two thousand. Uh, it has David Wenham in it, who you may recognize from Lord of the Rings or Three Hundred or indeed Van Helsing. Um <laughs> And And if the only reason you know him is from Van Helsing, (laughs) I pity you. Well, he plays this maverick mathematician who has devised a formula to predict the fluctuations of the stock market. So he joins this big bank, which is run by Anthony LaPaglia, and he has to prove his loyalty to the greed is good ethos. Now, here is some cultural intel for our American listeners. I don't think anyone in the world really likes banks, but in Australia here, hating banks is almost a sport. (laughs) <laughs> I can tell you that because I'm... What? I, no! Oh, yeah. Every Aussie's Did you like, know this uh-huh. why, Wayne? Uh, I happen to be the marketing guy for a bank. I, I was, <laughs> rather, back in the day. Um, so this movie is all about that world. And I think on one level it appealed to me because of my dalliances uh, in that area. But the way this movie shakes out, it is in total service to that bank hater mentality. And to be fair, it panders to the ideology of that, of that we hate banks a lot. In fact, it's so pandering, it could be one of Paul's Facebook polls. But <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I won't spoil it. But basically, the, I think this is really probably just very personal to me. I don't yeah, necessarily I why. recommend it to everyone, but it made me kind of smile-ish. And it also made bank people, executives, look flat out evil. Like evil laughing at children dying evil. <laughs> all right, I can promise you we're not like that, okay? We're not. You're not. We're all... You're right, I, you and know people what? at your level aren't. I don't know. But as you said, it's a sport to hate I on think, things. I think we're all just trying to feed our children, or in my case, buy weed. So it's just, <laughs> that's we don't know. It's a job, you know? Anyway, so yeah, the bank. Maybe give it a try if you're interested in how Australia views that type of thing. Well, given that 17 or years later, there was a um, triple C investigation into yeah, the bank. Yeah, see, everyone hates where that. <laughs> it was discovered in Australia that certain of the leading banks were charging people who were dead. Okay. Fees and Ma- things like this. For the record, I don't think that was an intentional file by anyone. Uh-huh. 
There's just people suck uh, and they leave the job uh, and I'm they don't I'm pretty sure shit. that they did, the triple C did find evidence that there was effectively they allowed it to evil happen? laughing at the ha ha who cares. Really? get more money. Okay, look, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not knocking your pick and understand why it's there at number 10. And very, I, I didn't mind the film. I yeah, thought it was all right. Film, good. As a non banking dude. My number 10 is a film which made two years ago, three years ago, my top 10 films of the year. It's from a local filmmaker made good, Ben Young. Oh, yeah. And it's called Hounds of Love. Okay. I think I remember hearing of this one. Go on. Yeah. This one stars Emma Booth, Ashley Cummings, and Stephen Curry. Stephen Curry, you'll know from a bunch of other Australian classic films. Mm -hmm. Redhead Dude, yeah. And a lot of on TV quite a bit. It's not really about, but it may as well be about, a serial killers that lived in our part of the world called the Bernies back 30 plus years ago. And it follows this young couple who basically pick up young women do horrible things to them and then murder them effectively. That's what yeah. the Burnies did do um, back in the day. And so some, it copped some criticism from some of the families of the Burnie this victims. Tough watch? Very tough. Hyper intense film. This young girl starts to play them off against each other. And once she's been kidnapped, wow. will she get out of there alive or will she won't? As well as it's following the family's desperate attempts to find her. So it's as straightforward as that. It's just really in, exactly the word you use, intense. Mm. And I was, I was expecting to see shit. Primarily because it was shot in and around Perth. Was it shot? I was going to say, yeah. it, so it's shot where we are. Shot here as well. I guess that, that's where the Burnies were. It is where the Burnies operated, yes. So it's got all those things going for it. And you start to wonder, is that... Uh, at one stage, I even thought apartment block featured in the film was behind where I used to live. Oh, man. You know what? Um, I don't know if we were into this before, but like uh, one of our bros owns some property or used to live on a property in Bedfordale and that's near some bush. And one of the victims was found in that bush where we used to hang out. Yeah, a little bit further away than we thought it was. A bit further away? Okay. Yes. But Still, yeah, in and around. Close there. enough. Yeah. So it, we had quite a connection to that. This film, as I said, it, it takes pains to say it's not the same thing, but it's clearly been inspired by. And the reason, yes, it's got a personal connection, a bit like The Bank for You mm-hmm. in that way, but it's a very well-made film. And Ben Young went straight on to do a couple of Hollywood films off this. And now he's you know, very well off as a director and established. Hmm. Okay, pretty cool. All right. I remember that one. My number nine is a movie called Sirens. And what? Uh, yeah, really? Yeah, it is. Let me tell you why. Full disclosure: I only saw this film because I heard Elle McPherson was naked in it. Um, so just like you with the Bernie thing, mm-hmm. I also have a fondness for <laughs> jubblies. Um, <laughs> <It's> inconceivable. <laughs> uh, what were they called again, Wayne? Let me think. Fun bags. No, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> with apologies to all our female listeners. Yeah, they're fine with me. Um, so <laughs> They were fine with him. This sort of thing ain't my bag, <laughs> baby. All right, people. This film is set in the 1930s in Australia in like the outback. And Hugh Grant plays this Anglican clergyman who, along with his prim wife, are asked to visit this painter, Norman Lindsay, who's played by Sam Neill, who he planned to contribute to this international art exhibition with a painting that is considered blasphemous. Blasphemous. So they go to this outback town. They meet him. He's got these three chicks with him. And they're always naked, right? Like, this is Portia de Rossi and stuff in there. People it you know. It was Portia de Rossi, Elle McPherson, and Kate, Kate Fisher. Fisher, yeah. So this, okay, it does feature a lot of nudity, but... <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> like, seriously, every woman in this movie gets completely stalkers, right? Um, Even Hugh Grant's wife? Yeah, I think he actually... I, I, I can't remember, but I think so. I think so. But <laughs> Wayne can't remember a conversation last week, but he's pretty confident... <laughs> About which chicks got naked in this film from 1993. I think I'm coming off a little harsh here. I think I'm coming off a little creepy here. I'm sorry. This is a smarter, more thoughtful than you might expect type of movie. Because Sam Neill's character turns out to be this kind of pan of sorts where whenever he's around, people under his direction are kind of inspired to have experiences where they lose their inhibitions. And it gets a bit sexy. But in a way that's not... It's not... Like, the director seems, like, wise and relaxed about sexual matters. He's less interested in sex than he is in the character's shifting attitudes towards it. So it actually ends up being this oddly kind of good movie. Yes, there's titties in it, all right? (laughs) But for real, uh, that's not why I'm picking it. It's just why I saw it. That's why I saw it. (laughs) Look, I can practically hear all the guys out there Googling this fucking movie. So don't even worry about that shit, all right? (laughs) It is is a good film. Uh, That that (laughs) truly (laughs) truly shocked me. Didn't see that one coming at all. I'm telling you, man. We play fast and loose. Okay, well, I, this was one that got promoted onto the list after I thought about it and sat with it a bit longer. This is from 2008. It's a film called Lake Mungo, directed by Joel Anderson. I'm not sure Joel Anderson has ever directed anything else, mm. certainly of note. What's it about? It's a film that's basically about a 15-year-old who drowns in the local dam 
and her family experiences a series of strange sort of inexplicable events. Mm. It's kind of like a, a mockumentary documentary about her and the impact her disappearance has had and her death has had. And then as the, the documentary makers go further, they kind of start to call upon or, or think that maybe her ghost is around. Oh, really? And so there's like images of little faces Ooh. in the background and there's that's, a lot of these That's the really, scariest kind of scary shit. Really slow zoom into a photograph and you're like, what's that? What's that? What's that? Oh! What? Is it that? It's a face creep looking in, in between trees and bushes. Ah, oh, that'll freak me out. Yeah, it's really disquieting. This film is quite unsettling and that's... Is it good? It's good? Obviously yeah, good, yeah. I, I think so. I watch. It's one of those films you got to watch at home, alone. No! i shit out. my pants. I'll shit my pants. <laughs> What's it called? Lake, Lake Mungo. Mungo. And then as they're, un- they're investigating all this stuff and, and following her as a person, other secrets emerge which may have an impact on what really happened to her. Really? So you- it's a mystery slash supernatural. I, I guess it's a horror because it's got supernatural elements, but it's more a, a I don't thriller. Think horror, yeah, supernatural thriller? Mm. Maybe I'll check that out. Because, you should. You know, filming that shit where something you're looking at and looking at and looking at suddenly appears to you, that's difficult to do. Technically, it's quite hard to achieve yeah. that. So I think that's pretty impressive. It's really dread filled this particular film. It's really? really? Yeah, which is, yeah. It, it creates an atmosphere and it really goes for the jugular with it and, and does it very, very well. I'm really sad to see that Joel Anderson hasn't made another film, if I'm, if I'm honest. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Okay, that's my nine. All right. Well, my number eight is a film called Chopper. Yeah, honorable mention. Honorable mention? Mm-hmm. Okay. Very now, close, very close. Was 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 to- toying with it for number 10. I once again speak to our American listeners here. Um, it may be hard to believe, but the idea of Eric Banner doing a dramatic role when this movie came out was nearly laughable. It was, because he was he a comedian was, from a comedian? Full Frontal, Fast Forward, whatever All it was. All these like, TV shows, and I like him a lot, by the way, but he was a stalwart of local TV comedy. And when he, he put on heaps of weight to do this role, and he's actually He's playing, almost unrecognizable. Exa- he is, and he looks quite a bit like the actual, per- the actual Mark Chopper mm-hmm. Reed, who was a real person. And, I think and what is it about? It's basically his underworld dealings and all of the shit that happened to him, because this, the real Mark Chopper Reed wrote a series of books where, which became very popular, and they were built, they were basically like kind of an Aussie Quentin Tarantino. Because he's thing. basically an underworld hitman, right? Basically, but an, yeah, a lot of other shit as well. Yes. But that and the thing that's weird about this movie is that Eric Banner is playing because the chopper, the actual Mark Chopper, is kind of a dickhead. Like he's just he's, well, he was larger than life. He was larger than life, but I think he was a bit full of shit as well. And there was probably some embellishment. And he oh, kind, sure. he almost says it like when he does, you know, and. But he's he's a Darrow. He's like a you know he's like looking at he's waving at the TV. Well, he's very iconic. Yeah. There's even a bloke now who still does the comedy festival rounds. Absolutely, doing like a chopper chopper reads bingo and stuff like that. So that's what <laughs> that's ten right. ten years after Ronnie he died Jones. or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, that's right. And this is the thing. He he even signed off the real chopper read signed off on this movie without reading it. He's like yeah fuck it whatever. So he's just and was really really from jail with Eric, Eric Banner. Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, it's a I don't know. I actually didn't expect to like the movie. I saw it really late. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, this is fucking killing. Like, he's just really nailing the role. And it's worth looking at if... I think it's just... A, it's relatively... It's a good movie, even if you don't know the, the legend or whatever. Mm. So, yeah. Chopper. Okay. My number eight is the most Aussie film on my list, I think. Wow, it's that's a big claim. Say. It's a classic. It didn't make my list last time. It's been promoted onto the list because I've seen it again since. And it is genuinely funny. The first time I watched it, I was like, oh, yeah. Mm. It's one of those films, the more you watch it, the funnier it gets. Which is a very small... That's unusual. Very small package of films because they kind of the jokes grow on you. What are you saying? And some of the lines are so iconic, they permeate through all of. Okay, then I know what it Australian is. Australian culture. I'm talking about 1997's Rob Sitch directed The Castle. Never seen it. Oh, still haven't seen I have The not Castle. Seen it. <laughs> everyone's spewing in Australia now because everyone's oh, seen it. Wow. So you know, well, that one goes in the pool room. That makes no sense. No. No. Um, I, I know um, I know the um, Tell him he's dreaming yep, I know that one Tell him he's dreaming every right. <laughs> <laughs> Basically a film Which is just very simply About a very ordinary Very blue collar Australian family mm-hmm. Who effectively Are going to have A new flight pass Straight over their house yep. And landing very close To the house And so the noise Just becomes ridiculous So they fight it in court mm-hmm. And they effectively Get a, a really small Dime lawyer To represent them And it's this you know, small dog versus the big corporate yep, lawyer yep. story. In the meantime, all these iconic, oh, what do you call this, love? Yeah. Oh, it's macaroni and cheese. Oh, it's bloody brilliant. <laughs> well, as a guy who didn't see it, I remember when it came out, talking to people who had seen it. And they were like, yeah, my dad used to sit down and get the fucking quokka out, which is the local sort of yep. trade paper, and check shit out and talk about prices. In the- and th- I think that's what rang so true. Um, I came to this country when I was one year old. So I'm culturally kind of Aussie, but still have the uh, 
childlike amusement for this place that I've come to. Kind of, it's weird because my family's not the Magic. same, and I had, all my friends are white like Paul. So it's, uh, but yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I mean, no one would begrudge you this. Everyone talks about the castle yeah. for real. Yeah, and it, and sorry, I did clarify. They have to move because of the new runway. That's the deal. Because ah. I live out near Tullamarine, so I know that place. <laughs> well, you should if you've flown into I Melbourne. Flown in, you yes. would, so. <laughs> Uh, look, it's got some iconic people, including Stephen Curry in it as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Michael Caton is the dad, and Tenny's the mum, and yeah, Sophie Lee, who was a bit of a heartthrob back in the. Remember her? She yes. did this TV show called Sex. It was just called <laughs> Sex, right? I'll tell you who does remember her. Wayne. No, but like she was like sort of a something of a, an attractive girl, but then she would talk about sex stuff, and it would just be this uh, excuse for Channel Nine to put on titties yeah, at, on a TV uh, show, eleven thirty at, at night type night. thing. And uh, yeah, she was hot. And her boyfriend in the film, Eric Banner. Ah, see, the guys are all over the place. There's a link there. <laughs> all right, that's my number eight. All right, my number seven is Romper Stomper. Romper Stompers! What's that? Hey, yeah, Romper Stompers! <laughs> is that when someone. Uh, back, back in the day, myself. Yes. What, were you there? I, no, I remember. Or was it me, Richard, of it. and Brett? Yeah. Friends of the show, Richard and Brett and I were walking and. Brett had. Um, Richard had just shaved his head. Brett had a sort of buzz cut, and my hair was pretty short at the time. And uh, some woman hung her head out the window as this film came out and basically screamed out at us, Hey, Rumpa Stumper! Which was hilarious at the time. <laughs> because it's about Australian skinheads. Exactly. And that's what this show is about. It's got Rossi Crow, <laughs> right? <laughs> Phone chucker Russell Crow. What, Rose Byrne? Is it? Oh, it's not Rose Byrne. It's Jacqueline McKenzie mm. in this show. And it's about, basically, uh, yes, Russell Crowe is the leader of a racist youth gang who spends their time attacking Asian immigrants in a rough section of Melbourne. And then they go on the run after losing this fight. Uh, they meet up with this teenage junkie, Jacqueline McKenzie, who suggests robbing her her, her dad's mansion because he's a sexually abusive asshole father. But her, her relationship drives a wedge between the two leads, the two guys, and it kind of all ends in a mess. But this movie is really, really violent. For its time specifically, it was what, considered... You also it was 92. Okay. So we were graduating in high school. Yep. Uh, and to see it would be quite hard because I believe it was R-rated. Uh, and yeah, the massively huge, um, just kind of that sub, that sub, I want to say culture, that racist undertone kind of yeah. head, skinhead thing. It Bit a, of a tough it watch. A, it was an infamous film when it came out. Yeah. But I remember being, because I saw it again late, but when I saw it, I was like, I actually did like this because it was well presented. So yeah. It's a good film. It's a good film. If it, I don't think it's in my mentions, but probably should have been. To yeah, be Robert Stomper. There you go. Okay, my seven is an, another infamous film in Australian terms. It came out in two thousand and five from director Greg McLean. It is the incredibly intense Wolf Creek. Never saw it, and will ever ever see it. Yeah, I know you won't. So I won't bang on about it for long. It's basically a film based on again a famous story or two. There was a serial killer who preyed on backpackers through not actually Central Australia. I think it was over east, uh, named Ivan Malat. Mm. Oh, it was, it was actually about him. Yeah, so it's it's lifting from him and lifting from another story about someone who got murdered out in the middle of the outback and sort of cropping them together. Oh, that's right, Falcone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, Peter Falcone. Yeah, and shows this guy who's. John Jarrett, who yep. at the time was on a show, I'm pretty sure called Better Homes and Gardens, used <laughs> to be on Play, Play School, <laughs> this TV show for kids here in Australia, if you're not from our part of the world. He's a favourite of Quentin Tarantino. Yeah? Quentin okay. Tarantino put him in that fucking Django. Django Unchained. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And he just is this over-the-top chewing scenery bad guy, like as ossified as they come, mm. who tries to help these three stranded sort of backpackers, or at least that's what he seems to do, brings them back to his place and proceeds to start to murder them God, that's in horrible. vicious ways one at a time. And he's just a complete psychopath. And the idea of being so isolated in the middle of Australia and with nowhere to go, no one to turn to, no hope of escape, really. That's how I feel every time I drive to fucking Margaret River. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ, we're getting wolf creeped out in this motherfucker. It's four hours, man. It's a four-hour drive. <laughs> Whoa, 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 Shut up. Some of us don't like to drive, motherfucker. You are Shut up. fucking moron. Jeez. Margaret from, River is not the same as Central Australia. It gets fucking remote. It gets from some, in some areas, it looks like you have no scenery. It's just fucking plain. In some areas, <laughs> Wayne can't see a building and hence packs his deck. Oh, no shit, man. One time I almost ran out of petrol. It's a horrible story. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, I, imagine, imagine that kind of terror multiplied by about four billion. And yes, that's I understand. <laughs> I have heard from people who have seen this movie that it sort of fools you. Like it, it doesn't start. Like it starts. It lulls you yeah, into sort first, of. It's, it's a, a slow burn. Slow burn. Slow build. And the first real act is just establishing these characters. There's nothing yeah. violent that happens at all. Yeah. And then when it comes, it comes 
hard and fast. I'm never fucking watching this. <laughs> All right. But I'm sure you doesn't been... probably doesn't end the way, although, of course, there's Wolf Creek 2, so it still doesn't probably end in the way that you would imagine. Oh, okay. That's mm. something. I'm still not watching it. Yeah, All right. <laughs> I, I would recommend it to you. I'm a, I would put you through that. All right. My number six is a movie that I'm oddly fond of. It is called Idiot Box. Yeah, it, I think it was originally listed and it's dropped off into my honorable mentions. Okay. Um, had to make I, way for some big films. I understand. I hadn't expected to like this film when I saw it. It's got guys like Ben Mendelsohn. Mendo. Mendo from The Last Jedi and whatnot and every other movie in the history. <laughs> um, this is one of his early roles and it's about two fictional characters. And Jeremy Sims. Jeremy Sims, yeah, sorry, is the other guy. And they're Mick and Kev. Uh, they have nothing to offer. They're stereotypical Bogans. Does the uh, Americans know what Bogans? Bogans would be... Bogans is, I think you're, um, you're in your American vernacular, the closest I could come with rednecks. Yeah, probably, but it's not quite right. Not really, because Bogans have investment it's not properties quite and stuff. Yeah. Either from it's not Chavs UK. either, necessarily. Yeah. It's our own thing. Yeah, it's Look something it like that. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're not Bogans. No, we're not. Um, no, we're not. Um, <laughs> anyway, they got a taste for cheap thrills, and basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we fucking can. Um, so. They basically run afoul and, and are out of money and they're like, oh, this is my last dole check or welfare check. You know, they're getting pissed off. So they decide to rob a bank. As you do. As you do, right? And they've got, they, the only problem is they have no experience, no guns, no idea, no. They're just like, we'll go in, we'll grab the cash and we'll fuck off, right? That's the whole plan. Anyway. I think I literally said that. In the movie. Yeah, I think they do. And they actually go in there and go to do the thing. But of course, the bank gets hit by actual professional bank robbers at the same time. And the whole movie is what full of. Exactly. But that's not it, really. It's more just the whole... I want to say larrikin. It's a bogan. It's the, the whole thing. There's a scene in there which Paul and I quite oh, enjoy. <laughs> where I don't know if we should do this. Last I, week was the gross out episode, we'll not be, this week. I think we'll be fine. I think we'll be fine. Jeremy Sim has this girl over and she's... <laughs> and they do it or whatever, right? And the next day, he's is the shot of him just cleaning the sheets in the bathtub. And Mendo comes in and goes, hey, what, what are you doing? And then it comes to pass that basically Jeremy Sims may have performed oral on this woman while she was, it was a special time of the month. And on then, her period, <laughs> way, like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you didn't go out of the growl, did you? you didn't, oh, that's just wrong. And then like Jeremy Sims is like cracking up as he's cleaning the sheet. <laughs> the shit's pretty funny, hey. It's pretty fucking funny. Um. <laughs> in this discussion, I want you to have a long heart and imagine who is who normally. In the- <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> I have no idea what the fuck Paul is talking about. <laughs> so I'm kiss my ass. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I've gotten pretty good at saying, that shit is wrong. <laughs> oh, son of a <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes, it's just sometimes it's just gross being a yep. boy, right? That's yeah. how it is. That's how it is. <laughs> All right, that's your... Was that your seven? Uh, it was indeed my... Wait. Six. Yes, six. six. Your six. All right, my number six. I rewatched it this week to see whether it should stay and retain its place on the list, and it does. Maybe didn't quite love it quite as much, but it held on here. It's probably about the same level for me as Wolf Creek, but I've gone with the because I interviewed the director of this film way back when we did interviews on the show. Ooh. It's Kia Roach Turner's Wormwood Road of the Dead. Wormwood Road of the Dead. Road of the Dead. It is an Australian zombie film. Which is becomes a bit like Mad Max, and you dig the shit out of it. Yeah, I think I heard about this movie. Yeah, I t- it was in my first year of the show. Oh, no, actually, it was before. Probably my first top ten, last ten. It was either my probably my number one. That's pretty cool. So way back when. This so, is a girl. No, no, it's ba- it's a guy. Kia. Oh, Kia. Kia. Okay. Yep. It's a, in fact brothers. They're twin brothers, or not twin brothers, just brothers. And so Kia and, and his and his brother wrote, directed, edited, production designed. Pretty much, it's a it's a two horse race, wow. or two horse show. And it looks so much better than that implies. Really? It looks really good. It's on Netflix right now in Australia. It's on Netflix? Yep. That's the balls. It's so entertaining. It's so fun. The name again? Wormwood Road of the Dead. W-Y-R-M? Yes. Which is a reference to a passage in uh, the Bible where the star Wormwood passes over and all the sinners will be cast into hell and people will take up to heaven. The rest will be here and... In purgatory, having to fight their way through the fire, or something like that, as one character talks about in the Very film. Very cool. And effectively, yeah, this, these comets pass overhead, and suddenly, pretty much everyone, except a select few people, turns into zombies. And these zombies have some really different ideas. Like these zombies breathe this vapor, mm. so at night somehow the vapor is they're in, inhaling it, or at least uh, it's becoming part of their system, and they move a lot faster and can jump further and all this kind of stuff. Interesting. In the day, it can be used as fuel for cars. What? Yeah, so okay, it's really different. Novel, whatever. novel. And they're all, they realize, well, you know, you get bitten, you're going to die. So they put actual body armor on, so they all look like dudes out of Mad Max. And they're running around in these big V8s and what, hotted up cars. Sounds kind of cool. And yeah, and there's, you know, there's, there's a token hot chick in it. 
and she's being taken by some nefarious scientist to do experiments on and then what happens to her is really different and interesting as well. It sounds like it's one of those movies that you and your mates come up with yes. and you're like, let's fucking do this, but then you do and it I well. Did it. Yeah. yeah. And I did it so well that they've actually done a concept teaser trailer, which I spoke about with him a couple of years back for a TV show based on this. Mm. And it was like a six minute thing. That's amazing as well. And I think I heard um, some rumblings that maybe the sequel to this movie might be coming instead. Well, and and, it, and they are releasing thing. another film in the interim, so they have got funding for another one. All right. It looks way better Where'd than it, it should. It's a mixture of practical and CGI effects, and it isn't terrible. Most of the CGI effects aren't terrible. That's great. When you're first movie out. out, forget about it. Check it out. If you're a fan of any of those things, action, horror. I mean, horror, it's very light hard horror. Yes, it's gore, but it's that kind of gore that's so over the top, it's hard to take yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Wormwood. All right. My number five is a movie called The Proposition. Oh, okay. Also dropped off my list. Did it really? Yeah. Honorable mention. So I'm, pre- I'm pleased it's on your list so you can talk about it. Well, yeah. I was recommended this film for years before I saw it, like maybe a few years back. And it's an outback set western uh, with like Guy Pierce, who's part of this infamous Burns Brothers gang who are just the worst, most murderous outlaws there is. Uh, there are. Uh, he makes a deal to save his life, or his brother's life rather, with the local law enforcement, Ray Winston. And basically they say, look, we've got your younger brother in custody. Your older brother is the worst, most mercurial, fucking, like, evil, evil dude ever. You have to go out and kill him, and then we won't kill your brother. So he goes out and hunts him down. And it's a pretty bleak tale, but it's great because of this kind of hallucinatory cinematography and this plot which is surprisingly accessible for some reason. And it's pretty dark because it's a brother who has to kill one other brother to save the first brother. But... All this shit, John Hurt's in this movie and stuff. Like, it's like, yeah. there's a lot of things that happen. Written by Nick Cave. Written by Nick Cave, did, did the music. And John Hillicote. John Hillicote directed, yep. yes. And it's um, it's sort of a, like, peck and par kind of, like, ish. It, I don't know. The style is, it's a Western and it's an Aussie Western. So it's just all dramatically different. There aren't a lot of them, but this is definitely the best example of a, of a Western set here. Yeah, an Aussie Western, yes. exactly. So, and, and for it to be sort of this good is, I don't know, I, I wasn't expecting it. And Guy Pearce is the shit, by the way. I, I think he's a really underrated actor. Mm. I mean, he's, it's pretty shit in Iron Man 3. Iron Man 3, he did as good as he could. <laughs> all right? I don't mind Iron Man 3. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but the proposition, worth a, worth a look. Mm, okay, very little anger at each other today, I guess. It's, I know. It's, it's all very legitimate. Yeah. <laughs> as is my number five. Now, you may give pause and say, is this an Australian film? So I did my research. My number five talk about is Mel Gibson's Hacksaw Ridge. Whoa. All right. Let's, now we'll talk. Now we'll talk. Now for me, actually, tell me what constitutes an Aussie film for you. Uh, okay. The film had to qualify as Australian to receive government subsidies. So despite being American born. I knew you'd learn this. <laughs> Gibson's early years in Australia helped the film qualify along with most of the cast being Australian, including Rachel Griffiths. Teresa Palmer, so Doss's wife in the, in the movie. Sam Worthington, of course. Hugo Weaving as Doss's father. Uh, Richard Roxburgh as the colonel. And Luke Bracey as his sort of antagonist and his mate in the film. Mm. Effectively, they've got, in the end, both state and federal subsidies. And that was the only reason the Where'd film they shoot it? got made here. Yeah. You're pr- if the fact... See, here's the thing, right? Just because you shoot a place in a, shoot a movie in Australia... Doesn't mean it's not an Australian... Like, like Well, The Matrix isn't an Australian film. Right, exactly. But that was shot here. Yes. Um, in fact, one of the buildings when Keanu comes out onto the ledge, I had a meeting in that building. There it's you in go. Sydney, so there you go. But this film, it's Australian through and through. Even though it's about an American war? Yeah. It, well, it's about an American guy, but it's shot, it's made here in Australia, so... Mm. Made yeah. here, got Australian DNA all over it, and, and it was made by Australian money. Yeah, okay. So if we're just arguing that, like, you know, Gallipoli, that's a very Australian movie. Oh, but, it's, it's Australian but it's not shot in Australia. So it's, you know, it's. Is it shot in Australia? I don't know. It's meant to be Turkey. Yeah, but I reckon it was shot here. But it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. it doesn't matter. Anyway, okay, yeah. So setting, yeah, okay. So right. once I read that, that it wouldn't have been made without basically financed by Australia. So it's a co production of America and Australia. Yes. Now, I believe, firstly, the, the production is how you set where, what kind of movie it is. Okay. So if it's. Either at least half to predominantly Australian in production, yes. then it's an Aussie movie. And there so, we go. All right. Okay, so yeah, you dug that one, hey? Don't need to talk. I know you don't love it that much. No, I actually don't. I, I know it's a good movie, and I know you told me, I remember you said that, that like the, the budget of it. $40 million. All right, and it doesn't look like a $40 million movie. Yeah. It looks way a, better. Part, aside from a couple of dodgy CGI effects, it looks like it's a $100 million those. film. It's a good movie. It's just not my jam, so I get it. But I, okay, cool. Yeah. I am surprised. And I won't say any more than that. I mean, it's based on a true story, so if, you've, if you're at all interested, you probably saw it from three years ago, but yeah, I won't spoil anything more Axel than that, Ridge. except to say it is a horrendously intense once it gets going. I would agree. Uh, which is harrowing beyond belief. 
and even my fiance watched the film and even she was impressed. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. Go. All right. Fair enough. My number four is a Heath Ledger joint. It's called Two Hands. No. Ah, good, good. <laughs> All right. We're obviously not that low. <laughs> That's why I stopped there. <laughs> All right, this was a 1999 film. Obviously, it was Heath Ledger and Rose Byrne and Brian Brown. And it's kind of the most Aussie gangster movie you'll ever see. Yeah, it's, uh, I remember reading somewhere it was described as Goodfellas with thongs. Oh, uh, God, that's good. But thongs in an Australian context, people, not in your international context. Yes, so not, not, not Australian, a Mankini or... <laughs> a, list, a Goodfellas with flip-flops, if you prefer. Flip-flops, there you go. Keith Ledger is this 19-year-old kid who's trying to get sort of in good with the local gangster, Pando, played by Brian Brown, who also does a great job being this ruthless gangster who also happens to be a really great dad mm -hmm. to his kid. It's kind of cool. Um, Heath Ledger is supposed to drop off some money to Brian Brown, but he decides to go for a swim at the beach while he's waiting, and he foolishly buries the money in the sand, goes for a swim, comes back, two kids stole the fucking money, now he owes Brian Brown, this big-ass gangster, all this fucking dough. So he does, like, you know, bank robberies and shit and basically tries to pay them back. But the whole thing about the film is it is really, really Aussie and funny. And just Shotty's a good mate. Shotty's a good mate. Yeah, just all shit like that is really fucking great. And I don't know, it's it's really, really accessible. It's really, really cool. Like I did not expect it to be quite so entertaining. But yeah. It loses a little bit for me in that it shoehorns in this weird supernatural narrator. I forgot about that guy. Yeah. Sorry, Heat Pledge's brother, who has deceased is kind of narrating the film narrating, and actually appears like like decomposed on yeah, like as he's in, walking in kind of in hell or yeah, wherever he, he is yeah that's right and he's sort of breaking the fourth wall kind of yep. right and you're right I forgot about that part that actually. part is the only part and probably why it was how I justified putting it where I did and it not. didn't work a little bit like but I think it's that unnecessary it's unnecessary Just is what cut it that was. Bit out. I don't think it hurt it that much no, but no. It, I'm yeah, not yeah. saying it shouldn't be on the list it obviously is on mine and higher than yeah, yours yeah and the fact that I didn't remember that part means that wasn't the good part mm. so yeah good call but yeah Two Hands excellent work I 100% agree my number four is the oldest film we've thus far discussed on the podcast today it is the sequel to one of the most famous Australian films of all time Mad Max I'm talking about <laughs> Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior this film is phenomenal wait which was so number one is just Mad Max if you haven't seen Mad Max in a long time, I'm mm. going to blow your mind. Okay. There's almost no car chases and there's almost none of Mad Max being, or Max being mad. Because he's just... That all happens in the last 20 minutes of the movie. Yeah, it's right. It's the setup, right? And that film, as groundbreaking as it was, and it sets up the whole series, was filmed on such a micro budget, they never sell the apocalypse as happening effectively. It just looks like a bunch of country towns with some hotted hot up cars. Is that what's supposed to be the case, though? Is it yeah. supposed to be post-apocalyptic? Well, it's, one? it's meant to be going down. Like well, The world is disintegrating around them, not in terms of a, a big bomb happening, but in terms of societal order is breaking down. Okay. And fuel has become the all-powerful yeah. um, economy, or sorry, uh, currency. Mm -hmm. Mad Max 2 absolutely sells it perfectly. Really? Now, there, is a, there is a much bigger budget for its time in 1981, but now the world really has gone to hell in a handbasket, and Max really is mad the entire time. And he becomes a reluctant hero trying to help this group of people who are trying to escape from this massive band of bikey I thug think, outlaws. I think that's the one I remember. It's, it's, just, it's the one should... with a feral kid. Yeah. It's the one with a gyrocopter. Yes, that's, that's, that's what so we got. Yeah, if, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you have, you almost certainly, with the possible exception of what happens to Max's family at the end of number one, you will almost certainly be thinking of Mad Max 2 with all the iconic shots, all mm. the awesome moments in it. So. Yeah, including I, including the the way that uh, George Miller has the camera kind of rack up over the bonnet of the of the truck and into Max is awesome. The, yeah? the hero shots and everything. Okay, else. I saw this when I was a kid, so I can barely remember it. But I think a lot of people like well this worth one. returning to. Really? Mad Max Two is just it is the easy example of a superior sequel to the original. Okay, nice one. My number three is a film called Dark City. Oh wow! Okay, Major that's a, list. yeah, nineteen ninety eight. Some honorable mentions. Okay, Rufus Sewell and like. Kiefer Sutherland, Jennifer Connelly, William Hurt, a bunch of people in this movie. And Rufus Sewell is this uh, amnesiac who struggles to uncover the mysteries of the past and the secrets of the oppressive city that he lives in. And it's a very cerebral kind of sci-fi flick. It's one of those films where you're not quite sure what the hell is going on. And then at the end, it plays a note that you kind of didn't see coming. It's extremely dark, as befits the title. Alex Proyas, what did he do after this? He did um, well, Die Robot? Before it. He did, yeah, he did Die Robot after he did The Crow before it. Wow, you can kind of see that. iRobot isn't the same, it's brighter, but it's this very dank sort of thing. But I saw this at the movies, and I remember it was a big deal because at the time... And he did that Nick Cage film, Knowing. Did he do off, that one? Off the top of my head, yeah. Oh, good for him. Hmm. 
there's a girl, Melissa George is in this, and she played some roles in Alias and stuff. She used to be on like Home, Home and Away. Away. I recall she's in heaps of stuff. Melissa yeah, George. I don't mean to thirty sound days. Like, thirty days of dark. Yeah, yeah, she did a bunch days of stuff. Of night, sorry. Yeah, uh, and Triangle, which a lot of people love that film. That's right. And I remember seeing this because I wanted to see the local girl because we used to, I saw her in cafes every now and then, mm-hmm. right? And it ended up being this like, William Hurt's in it, man. What the fuck? And at the end, I was quite blown away. I must say, it is. It's a little bit of an underrated one, I reckon. I've never seen it since it first came out. I liked it, but I can't remember what kind of undid me a little bit about it. I definitely want to revisit it. So, especially when you have it so high on your list, number three. Look, this has nothing to do with it, but Melissa George also went totally naked. <laughs> it's got. I just, I just remembered it now. I just remembered it now. I said it's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> just remember it now. Just I did. I, I seriously just remembered it now because I mentioned Melissa George. Just a reminder but... to you, listener, and mainly to Wayne, that uh, about 40 minutes ago, he forgot that he had a conversation a week ago. So, <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, it only just occurred to me. So anyway, uh, yes, I'm a goldfish. Okay. <laughs> Great. My number three... Really is a shock that it's not on your list because mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to be. There is currently a Netflix American series which is based off this film, and they've done three seasons and strung out what was a very effective film into three seasons from a first time director, David Michaud. It is Animal Kingdom. I never saw it. Fucking phenomenal. Wait, why is it good? Because is this one, which is the one which has like animal torture in it? Is that Snowtown? Snowtown, I think. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Which I didn't mind, but people raved about it too much, so it's not on my list, Snowtown, because I'm like, eh, it was fine, but it wasn't the end all and be all that people were making it out to be, at least for me. But Animal Kingdom, on the other hand. Animal Kingdom, yeah, is a story about a young guy, I think he's 17, maybe 18. His mum basically accidentally overdoses on heroin at the start of the film, and he gets taken in by his grandmother, who he's estranged from, who happens to be the head of a sort of local oh, mob, okay. Australian mob family. Matriarch, yes. Yeah, the matriarch of, and all her sons, are he, his uncles, are, are the people who do all these crimes, these bank robberies and everything really? else. Really? Guy Pierce is a cop on their scent. Mm. And they recognise him as the weak link. He's this young kid coming in. And he's got one psycho uncle, played by Mendo. Mendo! Yeah. Ben Mendelsohn. <laughs> who is scary as, as all fuck. And he's got one... The guy's versatile. Yeah, decent uncle who's a little bit more level-headed in the light, played by Joel Edgerton. Oh, so wait, this is a crime story? Mm-hmm. Crime thriller. Everyone, the thing I heard about this movie was that it was so harsh and so really, really like violent and this and this. Is it? Yeah. There's, yeah. I mean, it's violent, but it's not, I don't remember it being any more violent. It's probably just a bit more, I don't want to spoil anything because mm. you haven't seen it. Um, and I guess most of our listeners who are interested will have, but there are some unexpected plot developments, let's okay. say, that really right. really come out of nowhere and, and, and sock you on. And we started... At home, we started watching the TV series version of this, but for me, it was like, oh, we're, we're going to spend at least 12 hours getting to what I've seen in two. Yeah. That's boring to me. I know what's going to happen and how it's going to play out. Even I though, I might, yeah, yeah, I'm going to give it a try then. You should. You All absolutely right. should. I don't know if it is on Netflix because of the TV show is on there. That might be. Ah, okay. Count, but I'm sure you can find it if you want to watch it. Very much. Yeah, one of my favorites, Animal Kingdom. Okay, good one. My number two is Predestination. Wow. Yeah, I love this movie. Because I didn't, again, expect it to be so good. Jeez, that's high. 2014 movie. Oh, it's you, fine. You got your Ethan Hawke and Noah Taylor. Another, like, and Snook. Sarah Snook. Sarah Snook. Snook. Yep. This show is like a mix of Looper with a pinch of Minority Report. And it has one of the most complex and, for me, surprising plots I ever saw. It deals with time paradoxes. So it's an extreme kind of mindfuck kind of film. It's about this agent. Slightly more so than Avengers Endgame. It's so different here. It is <laughs> so different here. <laughs> But it's about this agent who can travel in time and he has to catch this el- particularly elusive criminal as his final assignment. And after this short setup, the film takes this most complex series of twists and turns and what you think is going on turns out to be an extremely unexpected aspect of something else. And I remember being, what I think I liked about it was I was continually impressed by the changes. I was like, oh, this. Oh, that's what it is. Oh, and it's that kind of movie. So the idea of the it's is that things are predestined and you can't really change anything. That's the idea of the film. But if I say anything more about it, I'll be spoiling it. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, predestination is... I don't know, like, I don't know, it's kind of like Ethan Hawke. Hey, yeah, it's a real actor, you know, it's just an Aussie film. That's kind of cool. So, yeah, but this is from the Spearing Brothers and mm-hmm. they did, a few years before this, Daybreakers, which There's, is also Ethan Hawke film, which is why yeah, they, which is why so they, they know dig him. him. And that was a bigger budget film. How was Daybreakers? Yeah, it's not bad. It's about I, uh, vampires, basically. I tried to watch that for this. Didn't get enough time. Yeah. But, okay. I don't think it would make your list, but it's fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Dig in this one. Okay. Uh, very surprising. I'm not sure what's higher, that pick or you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> not bad. Well done. <laughs> uh, my number two is Two Hands. 
Shit. That's high. But I understand. Well, too higher than yours. Yeah, I yes. Know. All right. So that's that's our list. 10 through 2. Let's uh, run back through them and then reveal our number one. Because uh, there's no one surprised by mine, but maybe they will be surprised by yours. I think they might, yes. but it would be a weird surprise. You'll see why. Oh, okay. Dear. Number 10, The Bank. Nine, Sirens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> eight, Shopper. <laughs> Fuck off. Seven, Romper Stomper. Six, Idiot Box. Five, The Proposition. Four, Two Hands. Three, Dark City. Two, Predestination. And my number one is Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, 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 oh shit. Damn. Damn. Oh. Now, my initial thing was that, is this an Aussie movie? I know, who is it, David? One of the, one of, one of the Duty, guys online? Duty. Duty, Duty jumped on board like, from Shaking Nerd and, Hoob right. and said, this is not an Australian oh. film, and whoever you whoever picks this will, will not get my vote. It's going to be tough, because it's, I'm pretty sure we both fucking picked it. Of course it's my of number one. Of course it's your number of one. Of course right. it's my number one. Okay. Duty, suck a dick. <laughs> <laughs> check I it out. I can say that, at least because Duty's a friend. So. Exactly, that's fine. No, but check it out, right? So, like I said, it's production that makes me call it one way or the other. This movie... The four producers are Warner Brothers, Village Roadshow, Kennedy Miller Mitchell, and Rat Pack Dune Entertainment. Now, Warner Brothers and Rat Pack are American. Village Roadshow is an Australian company with American funding, and then Kennedy Miller Mitchell is totally Australian. But this is an Australian franchise. Who wrote and directed it? George Miller. Who is? An Australian. Yes, based on an Australian film set in Australia. Okay, it wasn't shot here. It was shot in Tunisia, right? Yes. So, but, but it's supposed to be set in Australia with still. predominantly Australian crew. Yeah. And, uh... That's enough. It's a straight. That's film. it. Yeah. It's on every. Okay, if you go, it doesn't feel like you one do, you, you. Go and do your research. Mm. It's on every critic bloggers list of yeah. the top twenty Australian films of the new millennium. And on Wikipedia, if that means anything to yes, you. Yes, it's on there as well. As an Aussie, film. as is Axel Ridge. So yes, exactly. I yeah. mean, Wikipedia. I know is anyone can edit it and whatever else, exactly. but they can take it out as well. So. Yeah, I get it. I mean, it's, the, it's definitely an Australian film. There's no question. Well, in that, that's it. That being the case, I haven't seen a better Australian film. No, I know. I like there is no sh- better Australian film. I like film. to give you shit about it, <laughs> but, it's, but the truth is, it's fucking it's great. Mad Max Fury Road, Daylight, <laughs> <laughs> Two Hands. Two- <laughs> <laughs> According to Paul's list, yes, it's, like, it's, it's the only five star film on my list. Oh, uh, that's right. This is your perfect film almost. Yeah. yeah. Well, no. to quote you from your review of Longshot <laughs> last weekend, it achieved above 95% of what it was trying to achieve. Yeah, I would agree with that. And you know what's cool about it as well? The thing that struck me about the movie is that with the thing with the, the dude playing the guitar on the top of the <laughs> thing, right? That's such an Aussie Mad Maxi fucking... It doesn't... I don't know if that's accurate, but it just it felt like no, that. Yeah. Like You don't see that normally. No. It's not a normal Hollywood no. thing, so it's the shit. It's um, Australian. Yeah. It's Australian through and through. This thing bleeds red, blue, and white. Wait, it's the same as America. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, tr- it's, I think to quote David Powell, who said, uh, its DNA is all Australian. Can I ask you something? Has George Miller only done Mad Max movies? No. He yeah. did Happy Feet? Babe and Happy Feet. Babe and Happy Feet. Yep. So he was going to do the Justice League movie. Mm-hmm. I got to wonder what the fuck that would have been, man. It had to have been better than the thing we got. Oh, for sure. <laughs> That was all studio interference and the like. Uh, uh, if George wouldn't have done it if he had had that little studio interference to have to deal with. Good point. And he's done a bunch of other films too. Not a lot of other films, but enough. So it, what a diversity filmmaker. And he made this film when he was 70, I think, or 69. Dude, if I'm doing anything when I'm 70 or 69, forget about it. I'd be happy about that shit, man. Yeah, it's, it's such an impressive movie. And there are de- it has its detractors. Some of my friends who I've had to really look hard into my soul <laughs> as to whether I can still be friends with them. And they don't listen to the show, they, so I they, can say that. The thing that everyone says is, oh, they went one way, then they went the fucking other so, way. So, you know, it's still a fucking good show, man. Okay, it's a, it's, what, had they gone in a circle, would you have been alright with that? It dickheads? Yeah, I mean, The Last Jedi. <laughs> yes. It just went one way. The whole mm-hmm. fucking road thing. So, you know. Anyway. Anyway. Exactly my number one. So, here's my list there. Number 10, Hounds of Love. Nine, Lake Mungo. Eight, The Castle. Seven, Wolf Creek. Six, Wormwood, Road of the Dead. Five, Hacksaw Ridge. Four, Mad Max 2. Three, Animal Kingdom 2. Two hands and yes, Mad Max Fury Road All right. at number one. Wayne, any honorable mentions we didn't get to talk about today? Yeah, man. The Some of Us is a Russell Crowe and Jack Thompson movie, which I found quite heart wrenching. It. Yeah, okay, it's about like Russell Crowe is a gay son of Jack yep. Thompson, and Jack Thompson's widow. And uh, they're both searching for love. Right? They're both searching for yeah. love. It's it's kind of cool. Dead Calm was kind of okay. Yeah. It was okay. I wouldn't want to put it on the list. It's a bit stro- bit slow for me. It's yeah. very slow burn. I get it. And you know what? I actually bumped late. Crocodile Dundee. I don't give a fuck. I like Crocodile Dundee. I was a big fan. I was basically closer to being an immigrant then as I was now. <laughs> I wonder if that is the most successful Australian film of all time. I don't. Mm, I don't know that it is. But uh, I mean, financially, I mean, 
It's got to be Mad Max. Fury Road, if you if you if you if you're thinking that. Right? Oh yeah, maybe Fury Road's overtaken it. But I wonder if it adjusted Australian uh, inflated dollars or profit margin wise if it's more. Do you know Crocodile Dundee? Because again, I was a kid at the time. I enjoyed so much that it was that the it was embraced by the US and worldwide and stuff like that. Because you know, even especially back then, you don't see exported Aussie culture. So. It was really, really exciting to me. And I don't know, I even like the sequel. Fuck it. No, <laughs> the sequels are garbage. Uh, Particularly in Los Angeles or wherever the fuck the yeah, last one was. Uh, yeah, where was it? Yeah, anyway, yeah. yeah. But uh, this one is one of only two films I've ever been in where the crowd have, like, as one applauded in Australia. Oh, yeah. I, 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 D. It was and, so and Ram- popular. And Rambo First Blood Part 2. <laughs> no, no, Rambo, was it whichever one it was, we woke up and uh, was that Rambo 3 when he's in the... Uh, He's pretending to be dead and the Russian helicopter hovers down in Oh, front because of, of the mud? Oh, no, no, he's pretending to be dead. No, that yeah. was fucking... That it's was Rambo 3, two, I think. Two, one, three? Yeah, well, I can't yeah. Anyway. Anyway. They're the only two times <laughs> a whole cinema's burst into applause. Well, I mean, we've been in some screenings where there's been smatterings of applause and people... Absolutely. You know, but not like everyone... This kaboom yeah. exploded. Yep. Yeah, that's class. Anyone else on your list? Anything nope, else? that's it. You? Uh, so I've got These Final Hours, which is from another local filmmaker, Zach Hilditch. Mm. Actually graduated from the university where I work at. Which nice. Which is a really great film about the end of the world. Cool. The original Mad Max I mentioned, The Loved Ones, which is a disappointingly unseen, really cool Australian horror film, mm. basically about a, a psychopathic young woman and her father kidnapping a guy because she wants to take him to the dance, the school dance. Wow. And he wouldn't do it because he's too cool and, and good looking and, and the rest of it. <laughs> Damn. Razorback was bumped off my list <laughs> from last time around. Love that wild pig movie. Yeah, Dark City. I mean, Dark City. <laughs> Blackwater, which is, I think, by far the superior... Killer Croc film uh, over Rogue, which is also from Greg McLean. I think we're forgetting about Lake Placid. <laughs> Australian. Oh, Australian, I see. The Proposition and Undead, which is the Spearing Brothers' first film. Ah. About zombies, zombies and aliens yeah. and all this kind of shit. Very cool. All that, right. That's yeah, our list. There you go. Australian films. All right. Celebrated, which has been a lot of fun to talk about I today. I think so. Yeah. And, okay. uh, and, and quite agreeable for a change. <laughs> I honestly didn't think Mad Max Fury Road was going to be on the list, so I'm so glad. So glad. I just... was trying to keep it off, and I was like, you know what? Just be true. That is the best one that you can think of. In a, in a what's been a pretty shitty week, that is undoubtedly a highlight. <laughs> 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 All right, then. We finish up every episode with your feedback on the topic at hand in a segment that we call the Pop 10. Talk about. Pop 10. Talk about. off this week's Pop 10 with Matt from the Crossover Podcast. And he said on Twitter, all the Mad Max films. Well, what about... Nope, shut up, Mad Max. (laughs) Dean Jeffrey from the other half of the IMDb Journey Podcast had Chopper, Mm -hmm. Animal Kingdom, and The Babadook. Oh, really? Yes. I actually thought that might hit your list. Yeah. I was was so overwhelmed by the universal praise when this is going to be the scariest fucking movie ever. And I got the most annoying kid character, which is the point. But it just grated on me so yeah, much. Yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah. Always uh, a problem. Yeah, but a supernatural kind of thriller. Yeah, sure. A horror film. It has its moments. Okay. From the After Movie Diner, they had a whole bunch, and including most of the classic ones. Razorback, The Man from Hong Kong, Turkey Shoot, were the first three mentioned there. Okay, wow. Super Movie Bros, Dave, good friend to the show, will be on later in the year with his podcasting pal, Jay, Wolf Creek, Proposition, and of course, the Mad Max series, Road Warrior and Fury Road at the top there. Huge, huge honorable mention to The Loved Ones, great little horror flick. Yeah. It was on my honorable mentions as well. Nice. Synesthesia. I know I'm missing one or two, but the three that come to mind are Wake in Fright, Samson and Delilah, and it had to get mentioned, Picnic at Hanging Rock. Really? Yeah. Have you seen that movie? No, I just I just know where it is. <laughs> it's long. It's, it's it just, long. It doesn't, it's doesn't, it doesn't wrap up at the yeah, end. Yeah, it doesn't give you any satisfaction, but it's just so moody and atmospheric. And is it good? It wasn't, uh, wasn't my jam, okay, right. but lots of people love it. Okay. From our good friend Joey DiCarlo from the So Is It podcast, do check those guys out if you've yet to do so. Number three, Fury Road. Number two, Rumpus Not Pass. <laughs> and number one, Dark City. Yeah, there you what's go. up? I'll be a vote from Joey for you this week for sure. The Carter had BMX Bandits. <laughs> Nicole Kidman, son. Fury Break Road yourself. and <laughs> Chopper. Now, this is the most eclectic list of, you know, I asked for top threes. Mm. From the Rock Candy podcast, one of the girls there said, Wolf Creek. Mm. Mm-hmm. Muriel's Wedding <laughs> and Moulin Rouge. Oh, yeah. yeah. That is eclectic. <laughs> Usually you don't hear all three of them in the same... That's you know. right. Bad Reception Podcast. Mike from that show. Wake and Fright, another one. Long Weekend and Strictly Ballrooms. All classic ones mm-hmm. there. Uh, we mentioned him before. Sam Hurley, Movie Reviews and 20 Q's Podcast. Does Fury Road still count? If yes, that three times. <laughs> if not, Two Hands, The Castle and Mad Max 2. Very good. 
from Gidget Von LaRue, of course, would have some very strong opinions about Aussie films yes. from the Retro Cinema podcast. She also had Picnic, Hanging Rock, Gallipoli and oh. The Castle were her first three. Bunch of Mad Max were mentioned lower in her list as mm. well. From the oddball Aussie, hands down, it's The Castle. Now put that award straight in the pool room. <laughs> Very good. I'm sure you get that. <laughs> I do get it. That's a great, great reference. Well done. James Spence, top level, one of the top level patrons and good friend to the show. Number three, Romper Stomper. Should be remembered better. It's a decent crow joint. More people should see. Totally. Number two, Mary and Max. I believe it's uh, right high up there. It's an animated film from oh, 2009. Okay. Haven't yet to watch it. It's on my IMDb top 250 list. Wow. And number one, The Babadook. So James Again. loves the shit out of that one. From Ben Limit, three, The Dish, two, Animal Kingdom, and number one, The Castle. Mm. More love there. From Ant Wan, I've tried to choose the films I think best capture Australia as well as being good movies. Number three, The Club. I think it's about a football. It could be the one about sort of okay. Collingwood or a, f- a football team, 70s. Sounds pretty Could awesome. be wrong about that, Ant. Let us know. Number two, Animal Kingdom. And number one, The Castle. Okay. So the Castle seems to be the one coming out. Oh, again. yeah. And again, as well as from Austin Baker, number three, The Babadook, two, The Proposition, and number one, Fury Road. Big. Nice. Last one then from Mel Walker to wrap it up today. Oh, last two, Mel Walker and Lenny Salter. Mel Walker first, Young Einstein. He died with a falafel <laughs> in his hand. And Crocodile Dundee. Oh, that is that is a playful list. And she said, I made my list on memorability. Memor- Fair enough. Mem- Young memorability Einstein, over geez. time. And Lenny Salter had number three. I actually quite like Chopper. Yeah. Good Lenny. Lenny. Number two, Wolf Creek. And number one, again, Fury Road. There and what is. better way to go out on than that right there. Nice one, brother. Thanks to everyone. We, had, we were inundated again. With Thank you, guys. Many, many responses. We really appreciate it. Keep them coming. And we try and get through a couple of different ones every week. I just want to say thanks to everyone who takes the time to respond and indeed then listens to hear the rest of the show. Hell yes. All right, Wayne, how do people get back to us? Let us know their choices for this week in and week out. Go ahead and Google the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews Podcast or send us an email at thecountdownpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at the Countdown PC. Most Friday mornings Australian time is when the call for feedback on a topic goes up. You can also hit us up in our Facebook listener community. Link is in the show notes. That's where we mostly hang out, where most of the cool stuff happens. And if they can't leave feedback for the show, you can check us out on ccradio.com.au along with a bunch of other great Australian podcasts as well. Uh, Going to be a new one coming soon, mm-hmm. adding to this, but along with obviously Comic Confidential, Believe and Potterheads. So check out any and all of those great, great shows. All right, Wayne, what's happening next week for episode 216 of the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews Podcast? Well, I vamp as you desperately get it oh, up on I, your screen. I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> next week, y'all, we're going to face off. We're going to like... <laughs> to see? Take a face. Oh, That's right. Well done, Thank you. God I didn't get it in. <laughs> <laughs> there are two excellent directors working right now. One is Christopher Nolan. The other is David Fincher. And you know something magnificent about this that I only realized this what? week? What? Both have exactly 10 films. Yeah, I saw that as well. <laughs> pretty cool. Pretty cool. And that's what we're going to do next week. We're going to face them off where we do Nolan versus Fincher. <laughs> <laughs> <And> so- <laughs> Believe it or not, I didn't use the soundboard no, to do that. No, that was just me doing it. That was me. <laughs> Actually, I'm uh, do it again. One second. Nolan, Nolan versus, versus Fincher. Fincher. <laughs> They're much more dramatic okay, when Wen said that, that, was, that way. That I was think great. Every time next week we mention that on the show, we should r- r- mix in some <laughs> fact off the sample. I'm sure no one wants that. With, a, with big thanks to James Spence who came up with this idea in our little community, and we thought this is a good one. It should be a lot of fun comparing just very similar filmographies in the sense that there's 10 of them and they are probably have as big a fans as one another in terms of their impact I actually on had cinema. some struggles with this Ooh, in the last yeah because we have uh, full disclosure we'll be recording that one very shortly <laughs> but we'll talk more about that when you're here the episode next week alright that is it for today's show it's been an important one Australian cinema celebrating that I'm liking it good fun thank you Wayne thank you son and we will catch you all next week my name is Paul my name is Wayne have a great one. Oh, wait. The fuck, sound fuck board. Fuck it, fuck it. Just go. Just, just go out. Go out. You're the easy to Fuck it. Fart in your gender direction. How dare you. Dick. How Suck on dare it. you. You can't handle the truth. That the soundboard is a you member of this team. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week.